so and work its way back. So it's kind of like, um, you know, yeah. a running back trying to get through a defensive line, and it, they've got to bump through a lot of people to get where he needs to go. It's kind of think of more like a, a pinball machine. As, yeah. as, the, as the, the gas little sphere hits something, it bounces back, and so eventually it's going to make its way back to the back of the room. So again, think of that, that middle school girl who had just discovered perfume for the first mm. time. Or, or, or high school guys who have the bottle of Axe body spray in their yes. bag. And, and eventually it just permeates the room, mm. but it takes time. Even though it is moving at 1,000 miles an hour, um, it still takes time. Right, so effusion, we have gas going through a tiny hole, and defusion, the gas is kind of working its way through the room. Yes, indeed. Okay, so, so don't forget, gas passing through a tiny hole and then working its way through a room, effusion and defusion. Okay, how about this Graham's Law? Basically, what's that saying? I see it conceptually. Graham's Law is, uh, he, Mr. Graham was looking at this equation. And actually, we can go back to this equation. In fact, this is related to Graham's Law right here, this equation. Actually, you know I should say something about this equation that I just solved? I'm going to keep bagging this. This is sometimes called um, the VRMS, or the... Uh, root mean squared velocity. Root mean squared velocity. But uh, he basically was saying, what would be happen if this mass was big? What would happen to the velocity? Big mass, that's, the mass is in the denominator, so the velocity is going to get smaller. And if this number was small? Then the velocity gets bigger. So when we took it in Graham's Law, Graham's is talking about how fast something diffuses yep. or effuses. Basically, um, massive, or more massive molecules travel what? Slow. Slow. Now, when we say slow... Relatively speaking. Fast is 1,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. They might be going 600 miles an right. hour. So don't think of it slow in, the, in your world. And then uh, small or uh, less massive, or we can say small, but no, it's not really the volume, it's the mass. Yeah. Less massive travel faster. I think of the elephant and hummingbird. You got a big old gigantic ele elephant Okay, he's just kind of lumbering along, boom, ba dum, ba dum, and then a hummingbird has a very, very small mass and just buzzing all over the place, a lot faster. The elephant and the hummingbird. What is that? That's a hummingbird. Really? You didn't think that was a hummingbird? What's that? Oh wow! It's an elephant. I, I got the elephant. <laughs> sort of, kind of. That wasn't really a hummingbird. No, it looks. Oh, I need. I don't. Oh, now? Okay, that's better. That's wings. I it was supposed to be wings. It was a stick figure hummingbird. Let's okay. Stick, let's stick with math and science. Yeah, I maybe should. My, my <laughs> sketching artistic... And the harmonica. Oh, there we go. He needs ears. Okay, Graham's Law equation. They, uh, actually, which would be the small, the fastest gas that you could think of? Uh, hydrogen. That's the least massive. Because it has a molar mass of just two, two grams per mole. So it would be the most rapid molecule that exists mm -hmm. at, at the same temperature. All right, Graham's Law basically says, it actually it's a comparison. You mm -hmm. take the, um, the rate of gas 1 divided by the rate of gas 2, and that's equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas 2 over the square root, that says square root, of the molar mass of gas one. Now I want you to make a quick note here. The one is kind of opposite here. Yep. This is actually a derivation of that equation, the root mean square velocity. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go into the details of how that's done, but this is book. the equation that you need to uh, use, which we're about to use right now. So yep. let's take a look at this. All right. So we want to compa compare, calculate the effusion rates of uh, two different gases. Actually, these are to find the rates. So we're going to actually use that root mean square velocity. I don't know if we need to do both of these, Mr. Sams, do we? Let's do hydrogen. That's the one we just talked about. So okay. we're going to say uh, VRMS is equal to the square root of 3K T, no, 3RT over M. And so this will be the square root of 3 times 8.3145 times, let's say again, 295 Kelvin maybe. It says 295. Sorry, it's hard to just read there. Divided by, and that's going to be, the molar mass of that is 2 grams per mole. So that's going to be 0 0.002 uh, kilograms per mole. And you come up with a... That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem right. I must have put Sam's. something in my calculator. 3 times 8.3145 times 2... 95. 95. Divided by double Divided by 0.002 square, square root. root. The answer, there we go. 1918. 1918 meters per second. That makes more sense. That's really, really fast, Mr. Sams. I think that's like 
two thousand. That's really fast. More than that. Hey, can we use the Graham's law equation with that number and figure out using Graham's law what the rate of diffusion for the uranium hexafluoride would be? Compare those two gases. Yes, that's what we could do. Let's I think do that. that might be the next question, but it's not. It's not on my paper here. Oh, so. but we'll do it right now. I, I don't know. I thought that so might be. So let's add idea. that. And so what we're going to do. So if we know, okay. So if we know that hydrogen travels at nineteen hundred and eighteen meters per second. What does uranium hexafluoride, that'd be UF6, travel at the same temperature? So we can say the rate of gas one, let's call hydrogen gas one. Do I want to do it that way? Um, yes, I yeah. do. Yeah, yes you do. And I want to call this gas two. So I can say 19, actually let me put the equation down. I could say rate one over rate two is equal to square root of M2 over the square root is an M1. Now we know the rate 1 will be 1918. Rate 2 is essentially x. Mm -hmm. So I can say 1918 over x is equal to the square root of gas 2. 352. Now this adds up to, it'd be 238 plus 6 times 19. Molar mass is 238? No, 352. 352. Square root though, yep. over the square root of 2, because that's an easy one. And so if you cross multiply, you can say 1918 times the square root of 2 is equal to square root 352 times x. Or, what's 1918 times square root 2? Oh, oh you, you got you just solved I, I, I right? just I did the whole thing. Sorry. 1918 times, times 1.4 be 20,000 two, some change. 2712 point5. 2712 equals what's the square root of 352? 352 square root 352 is 18.8. So you divide both sides by 18.8. 2712 divided by 18.8 gives us 144. So he's traveling at a whopping 144 meters per second, really much, much slower mm -hmm. than 1918. So this is just a solve the problem type of a deal. Um, sometimes they might ask you a question like this. Let's add this question here on this, this okay. uh, deal here. Sometimes I've seen a question that'll say, how much, so just copy this down, faster is hydrogen than chlorine? in terms of rate of effusion. Yeah. There so, we're just going to compare the rates. We're going to get a ratio of the rates. So what I like to do is I like to call the rate of the slower one a 1. Yeah. So let's the chlorine is the bigger molecule, so it mm -hmm. travels slower, and the hydrogen we're going to call x. So we're still going to use the same equation where we're going to say, um, now we're going to call um, uh, the chlorine, this will be gas 1, by the way, the hydrogen. I always put yeah. the faster one on top. It makes yeah. a lot your life easier. Mm -hmm. And this will be gas 2. And so I'm going to say that um, x over 1, these are the rates, mm -hmm. would be equal to squ square root of 71. That's chlorine over the square root of 2. Yep. Chlorine is 35 and a half molar mass times 2. That's where I got the 71. Of course, hydrogen is 2. So just 71 square root over square root 2 gives you divided by square root of 2 gives us uh, 5.95, so about, about 6. About 6. So hydrogen travels at the same temperature about 6 times faster than does chlorine. Yep. So if I was to have a hydrogen spill, gas spill actually, <gasps> it would travel across the room 6 times faster than would the chlorine. Chlorine. Yeah. By the way, chlorine is a colored gas. If you ever see a colored gas, run. Bad. They're all poisonous. All right. Now, let's have a, a little visit about temperature. Mm. A lot of people get temperature all mixed up. What is temperature measuring? Uh, it's the average kinetic energy of a molecule in a sample. So temperature is not really the hotness or the coldness or so of something. It measures how much energy right. is in something. So it's oh, here's our equation. Kinetic energy equals? Three halves over RT. Three halves. Or not times RT. Sorry, I keep saying over. Yeah, we Three need to do this in a different order, but it works yep. out. We're good. But that's a, so. If you double the temperature, what happens to the kinetic energy? Uh, double the temperature. We're going to double the kinetic energy. Now, what do we mean by double the temperature, though? It has to double in temperature Kelvin. Now, very important in all these equations. Temperature must always be in Kelvin units. There's very, very few exceptions where it mm -hmm. can't be. So when in doubt, convert to Kelvin. And of course, the conversion from Kelvin to Celsius is Celsius plus 273 equals Kelvin. 
And it's just Kelvin. It's not degrees Kelvin. Actually, that's degrees Celsius, but not degrees Kelvin. Right. It's actually 273.15, if you want to be exact. Actually, that's not exact even, but closer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. What's next? All right, pressure. Oh, we got to talk about pressure. Pressure mm. is these gas molecules. If you got a room filled with gas molecules, they hit the wall. Yep. Or they hit you, or they hit me. Ouch! They hit stuff. And then they create pressure. So mm. pressure is caused by... Collisions of molecules with walls of containers. Or with the container. Yeah. So if you got a balloon blown up, the uh, the molecules are pushing on the on the inside of the balloon, holding it out. Yeah, so the balloon is actually inflated by these molecules hitting the outside. Some, of course, are not hitting it, but those that do are the ones that cause this to occur. Yeah. And we use what to do measure pressure? A barometer. A barometer. Who invented the barometer? Boricelli. Mr. Torricelli from Italy. Torricelli, sorry. What Torricelli. Did I, say? I said Boricelli. Torricelli. It's Torricelli. Sorry. Okay, so um, we're going to skip a page here. And here is the, uh, for just a moment here, um, this is a Torricellian barometer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. I paste it. And um, this is actually our barometer in our classroom and I don't know okay, you can see this here this right here is a pool of mercury and this is mercury the element mercury okay and the way this works is you can then read it's hard to see but if you look carefully right you need a different color it looks like if I, if I uh, look right in here there's this column of mercury that goes up and up and up and up and then stops maybe say right here Actually, actually, I think it's going to stop right here. You just kind of read it like a thermometer. You read it like a thermometer, and it tells you the height of the mercury column. Now, the way that you actually make a barometer, it's actually eminently simple. What you do is you have a container, and it is filled with a liquid. Any liquid would work, although we'll talk about why mercury works the best. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I take... I wouldn't recommend getting a pool and puddle of mercury and splashing around in it, by the way. Yeah, it has some safety issues. Yeah, you then fill, brain damage. You then fill a container up level full with the liquid. Let's all the way to the top. All the way to the top. You then take your hand. Stick your thumb over it. And you stick your thumb. This is your thumb. Nice okay. thumb. I know. And then it's attached to a hand. And he's got six fingers. Okay. And he turns <laughs> it upside down. And then the pool of mercury, and this is, this, this is mercury, it then stings upside down. And then it fills... But well, something it's, full. In, it's full, but something intriguing happens. It falls down. It falls down, assuming it's you have a tall enough column. Yes. And this height is measured with a ruler. And this ruler measures the height of the column of mercury. And um, if you live at sea level, it would be at what height on an average day, Mr. Seven sixty millimeters. Seven hundred sixty millimeters. And what is above this? Empty space. This is a vacuum. That's correct. So, but I mean, if I was to do this with water, I could do this with water. Yeah, you and have I've done a really, 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 really tall column. Yeah, in fact, you know, folks, what it would have to be is you could do a water barometer, but it would be 30 feet tall. Yeah. Or 30 meters. I can't remember which. It's very tall. Yeah. So they use mercury. Why do they use mercury? Mercury is really, really, really dense. So yeah. you're going to get a lot of mass for a very small volume. So the, the sheer mass of the mercury is it's being pulled down by gravity, and that's what's creating the space at the top. So it's actually keeping that column... Um, height that it has is the air pressure. The little molecules of air are hitting this and it's pushing it up into the into the barometer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all of it would fall down if there was no atmosphere pushing da back down on the mercury. That's correct. So, um, and this is true. Now, if you were to go up in elevation, so if you lived in a, in a little town like, say, uh, Woodland, Woodland Park, Park Colorado, 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 perhaps, at 8,700 feet, um, what would you discover? Uh, well, there's not as many molecules pushing down on the atmosphere. And so you would find... So that's going to drop even further. So I think our average pressure on an average About day 560, yeah. is 560 millimeters of mercury. But 570, just, I think. Yeah, maybe yeah, something, something like that. that. So depending on where you live, the pressure is going to be different. If you're a sea level person, it's pretty much right around 760. Mm -hmm. But if you live up at altitude like we do, it's going to be a smaller number. Yeah. All right. Another way to measure pressure is if you're trying to measure pressure of a particular gas, you can actually just measure the height column. This is called a, a U-tube manometer. 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 Do, 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 do. <laughs> Manometer. There you go. <laughs> That's a joke. Something. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what you do is. You